Alrighty everyone, welcome back. So, our topic of discussion for today's review video is the Minnesota Wilds. So the Wild had an interesting season. I feel like this team, even though they missed the playoffs this year, there's a solid chance they'll be back in it next year. It's only because this year, they had a really bad start to the season. That is a lot of why I thought the Minnesota Wilds struggled to start the year. But I think next year will be much better with the right moves. They went 39, 34, and 9 for 87 points this season. They were 20th in the NHL. So they had above a 500 record by five games. They were the, I think, the third best team to not make the playoffs when you look at the standings. Other people were trying to people were trying to argue with me in my other videos saying that, oh no. The, the Blues weren't the best team. No, like, I mean by standings. So the Wild were the third best team to uh, miss the playoffs. And they didn't play bad for stretches this year. I would say that towards the end of the season, they got way better under John Hines. But obviously, <clears throat> it was too little, too late. They had a .530 points percentage. They scored 251 goals, led in 263 for a minus 12 difference. That was one of the big problems this year. It's a, it's pretty similar to the Devils, but not as blatantly bad, was the goaltending and the injuries on the blue line. Jared Spurgeon missed a lot of the season with injury, which is why he which is why this team was probably worse than they were last season. And the goaltending too did not look good this year. When we get into the goaltending numbers, they were better than the Devils, but it still wasn't enough to get themselves into the playoffs. Most definitely, it was not enough. So, that speaks volume there. I do think, though, and I, I, I will say this. I think this team is good enough to get back in it next year. It just stinks that they just kind of wasted another year here. However, they do have one more year of, of paying Parise and Sutter. So, I guess that's a benefit. So, they have a 2016 and 5 record at home. They are 19, 18, and 4 on the road. They have a 3.02 goals for per game, which is 21st. And a 3.17 goals against per game, which is 20th. So, again, the goals against and the goaltending numbers got better as the season went on. But when you look at that for the most part, their numbers were mostly average. When you look at goals for and goals per against, goals against per game, they were very average. And I think that if this team wants to get back into the playoffs, they need to be at least above average. And I don't think I'm surprising anyone by saying that. They have a 22.7 power play percentage, which was ranked 10th. They had a good power play. And then they had a 74.5 penalty kill percentage, which was ranked 30th. The third worst penalty kill in the league. That was a big reason and why this team just couldn't seem to get off the ground. Um, especially when you're a team that lets in a lot of power play goals when there's a lot of special teams involved in the game. That's not good. That's not ideal whatsoever, and that's something that they need to look at to improve on in next season. And and there's some years that sometimes your strategies don't don't work out, but they need to figure out a way to fix that penalty kill if they want to get back into the playoffs next year. That's one of the bigger things that I looked at when I looked at the raw paper numbers. But above all, their numbers aren't terrible. They're they're pretty solid for a team that barely missed the playoffs. But I do think that. There's a few things that definitely need to improve, like secondary scoring, the penalty kill. There's a few other things that definitely need to be improved upon in the offseason with this team for sure. So, when you look at scores, guys who led this team at scoring this year, Kirill Kaprizov leads the way with no surprise to anyone. Kaprizov, 75 games played, 46 goals, 50 assists for 96 points. Kaprizov had a very good season. Um, I think that even though the Wild missed the playoffs, he should not write Kaprizov off. He had an amazing year, and he just continues to be an amazing player for this Wild team. I would definitely make the argument that he is a top 10 player in the NHL. I would. I would make the argument because he has carried uh, these Minnesota Wild teams into the playoffs or just barely close to the playoffs. So Kaprizov gets a lot of credit. Matt Boldy is second in scoring there with 75 games played, 29 goals, 40 assists for 69 points. Boldy had a very good season this year. And it's a part of that young regime that made a mark in the NHL this year. There were a lot of young players from Minnesota who got some playing time and looked very good, particularly. So Matt Boldy was one of them. And it makes me excited, too, for the future because I think Bill Guerin has a lot here. It just sucks because... They're still paying Parise and Sutter. And I know I've brought it up in a lot of my Minnesota Wild videos in the past. 
and I know it's like a main top talk point, but it's hard to create a team to win when you're like $17 million behind everyone else. It's hard to do. So I give credit to Garrett a lot for this team being a consistent playoff team the majority of the way through. But when they get that $17 million, I think Garrett's going to have a lot of money to be able to do some things. And I think that this team has enough young prospects and a lot of young talent that they can definitely look forward to that. And they're going to get another good guy in this year's draft as well. Uh, Joel Eriksnack is third in scoring with 77 games played, 30 goals, 34 assists for 64 points. I thought Eriksnack had a good year too. One of the better two-way forwards in the league. Um, I've always liked Eric's neck a lot. You got Matt Zuccarello. Zuccarello still keeping up a good pace at his age with 69 games played, 12 goals, 51 assists for 63 points. Again, Zuccarello had a good year. I think that he should get a lot of credit for what, ha what, what, what went on this year and them trying to make a push at the end. I think Zuccarello has played well this year for sure. And then he got Brock Faber. Faber, fifth in scoring, is a rookie, a quarter finalist. Probably not going to win the Calder because there's someone from Chicago who's playing really well, but I do still think that he probably is the second best rookie this season. He had 82 games played, 8 goals, 39 assists for 47 points. With the absence of Spurgeon for a lot of this season, uh, I think Faber's really taken advantage of that and has really become a solid top four defenseman in his first season alone. And that shows that the next couple of years are going to be very exciting collectively. Uh, for the Minnesota Wild with Brock Faber at the helm. So I'm looking forward to watching Faber's career unfold because he was a second-round pick for Kevin Fiala, by the way. Like, the Wild needed to trade Fiala because they didn't have the cap space to sign him, and they got a guy back in Faber who looks like an amazing defenseman. Now, Fiala's doing good things with Kings, but still, I'm taking Faber all day. Ryan Hartman, next up here now, still playing very well at his age. Uh, 74 games played, 21 goals, 24 assists for 45 points. I thought Ryan Harmon had a good season this year too. I think he's starting to regress a little bit from those first couple of years in Minnesota where he looked really good. But I still think that Hartman has the potential to become a solid, you know, middle six forward for this wild roster. And I think that he's definitely a part of this team moving forward. Marco Rossi. Marco Rossi, another young player who struggled out of the gate, I will I will say that, but he's really had a good season this year, 82 games played, 21 goals, 19 assists for 40 points, I believe he's a rookie as well in this season, and that's crazy to think because he was drafted like four years ago, and he's just now making his debut, it's kind of crazy to think to be honest, but Faber, I give, or Faber, Rossi, I give a lot of credit to him, he's had a pretty good season this year. Uh, Marcus Johansson, 78 games played, 11 goals, 19 assists, 30 points, Forget a lot of the time that Johansson's in the league, but I guess not a bad bottom six guy, like a good like third liner and second liner at some points, but still solid. Uh, Jonas Brodeen. Brodeen was 62 games played, 7 goals, 20 assists, 27 points this year. Again, I thought Brodeen had a good season as well, considering the fact. And then Jake Middleton was 10th in scoring with 80 games played, 7 goals, 18 assists for 25 points. Middleton has a very good story in the NHL, being undrafted. Um, obviously going through that. I think he's had a very good story um, in the NHL. He's become a legitimate NHL at his age, so I give him a lot of credit for that. But regardless, uh, I feel like the Wild, when you look in terms of what happened this year, they had, they had some guys who could score, but you need some more depth. You need some more offensive firepower. And I get it. It's hard to do that. It's hard to go out and acquire those guys when you're trying to spend a lot of your money paying your big name guys, especially too. Kaprizov expires soon, which thankfully that's when the cap comes out. Um, but Kaprizov um, and this team definitely need a little bit more help on the on the uh, depth end of things, but I definitely think that Garen can definitely solve that problem for sure with the cap rising up as well. That's definitely a benefit too. Uh, so look at the goaltending. The goaltending, as I mentioned earlier in this video, has been a struggle this year. Uh, Philip Gustafson, 2018 and four, a 3.06 and a 0.899. So last year, Gustafson had a really good start to the season, really good second half of the 23 of the 22-23 season, and there were a lot of wild fans that were very optimistic. I remember I made like my top 20 goalies list, and people were mad that I have Gustafson so low. My theory to that was that I thought Gustafson would had too small of a sample size to really put him higher. And this year kind of proved to me why I was a little bit hesitant to put him like so high in my top 20 goalies. 
this year was this year was rough for him initially, but I do think that he played better as the year went on, for sure. And I think the same thing goes for Marc Andre Fleury, who went 17, 15, and 5 for a 2.9 in and a 0.895. I think the same thing can be said for both those goalies. They played better as the year went on. But obviously, when your goalie save percentages are both below 900, it's not ideal to try and get the team into the playoffs when you're you're trying to overcome that, obviously. So I give a lot of credit there too. Um, the Wild for still, even though their goalie statistics weren't great, they still kind of got really close to the playoffs when you look in terms of uh, stats. I think they were only like four points out or something I'm from the East. I, I'm not sure about the West. Uh, so Jesper Wallstead as well played some games this year. Two and one, a 3.01 and a .897. So I say this for a lot of goalies. I think sometimes, sometimes a goalie will play like two or three games in the NHL at first, not play great, but still have those games of experience. I do think, though, because Marc-Andre Fleury is coming back for one more season. This season is going to be his last. I do think that after Fleury leaves, it's Wallstead's net. I, I think Wallstead will get the full backup role, unless if they decide to move on from Gustafson. But I think that they keep that same tandem this year, give Gustafson another year to develop, give him a few games up in the NHL, like here and there. Who knows? Maybe someone gets injured and suddenly it's Wallstead's net already. But I think that it's smart to give Wallstead one more year to get himself ready for the NHL and then he can come in in 25-26 in and be that starting goalie. So we'll see. We'll, we'll see what happens there, but that's what, I, what's, that's what I would envision would happen. But we'll see, obviously. So ins and outs this year, guys who came in and left midway through the season. Uh, guys who came in, Will Butcher. Uh, Turner Elson, uh, Ovin Shikov, a third and a sixth. Guys who left were Connor Dewar, uh, Pat Maroon, Nick Patan, and Brandon Duhame. So they got rid of some guys they could at the trade deadline. Got some later draft picks. Nothing too extreme. But I think that still, um, it's good to, you know, obviously get some assets that are in return and try and move off some guys you can. But regardless, that's what they did in the 23-24 season. That was their stats, numbers, all that good stuff. Uh, let's get into the future. Uh, what's coming? The draft is coming very fast. It's in a couple of days. Or not a couple of days. It's a few uh, weeks away still. But the, the Wild have a lot of picks. They have a 13th overall selection. They have a second, no third, a fourth, two fifths, one sixth, and no seventh. So they have a good amount of draft picks there to really get something going. They will get a solid player at 13th overall. I have Cole Iserman going there. I don't know. We'll see if Iserman's the guy they want or the guy they exactly need. We'll, we'll find out, but I think that Minnesota will definitely have a solid player there at 13th overall. I don't know if it's going to be one of the greater players of this draft, but I think they still will have a solid player to choose from there in this draft class overall. So they have that advantage. The UFAs and the RFAs are both very short lists. You got Lucini, Goligoski, and Mermis. I think, honestly, you let go of all three of them. Maybe keep Lucini around. But I think Goligoski probably walks. I think Mermis probably walks. Um, I think that, you know, you want to create more, more cap room, obviously. And then RFAs, Mason Shaw and uh, Declan Chisholm. So I've talked about Chisholm before in my prospect previews. Uh, prospect pool overview, sorry, like last summer uh, when he was with Winnipeg. I said that he couldn't find a spot with the Jets. Maybe that changes for the Wild. He played some games up this year for them, but I definitely think there's more to it. So I think they keep him around with a contract. Mason Shaw, I'm sure they'll keep around too. But what what this team needs, I'd say, is depth for sure. I think they need some more secondary scoring. Maybe just a healthy blue line, honestly. I think if you keep that blue line healthy, they're a playoff team. Not a cup team, but they're definitely a playoff team. And I think that there's a lot of positivity when you look in terms of that. This team isn't far off, but I think that... Again, when the when the Parise and Sutter contracts stop be stop having to pay them, I think this team will have a lot more options and a lot more ability in what they can do. So, anyways, that's your 2024 review for the Minnesota Wild. Let me know your thoughts in the comment section down below. Thank you all very much for watching. If you enjoyed, make sure to like, subscribe down below. I really appreciate it. Next up is the Pittsburgh Penguins, uh, one of the teams that does not have a first-round pick this year. But regardless, thank you all for watching, and I will see you guys in the next video. Adios.